would rather write one good book than ten mediocre ones. Donna Tart. Dear writer, Today I wanted to take the time to remind myself and you that it's okay to not write a novel in a month, that it's okay to write slowly. Even though I'm personally a fan of fast drafting, today I just woke up not feeling my best and I've also been struggling with my story recently, so I thought today I would escape the grinding a little bit and take things slower. And in order to do that, I thought I would channel the wisdom of another writer, and the writer is Donna Tart. If you're saying you write every day, I do. Then you've more or less written solidly for the past 21 years. I have written solidly, yes, but I've written solidly in scraps. I mean, not every day do I sit down and write a tremendous block of Finnish prose, but I'm always fiddling around and writing little bits and bobs of things. And some days when I'm out and about and with my notebook in a pocket, it is only bits and bobs. Known for publishing a novel every 10 years, she is proof that not all great writers are made the same and that writing slowly is valid and sometimes necessary. There are two main reasons why I chose Donna Tart as my inspiration today. One, I feel like slowing down. Donna Tart says she relishes in taking her time with each story. Taking on challenging projects is the way that one grows and extends one's range as a writer, one's technical command, so I consider the time well spent. I feel that the book I'm currently writing requires that kind of time, perhaps not a decade, but the kind of time that isn't rushed, that has my full attention. 2. I want to challenge myself. The truth is, I've never actually read anything by Donna Tartt, and the culprit for that is my perfectionism. So it's a flaw of mine that I'm really trying to fix and I just feel like Donna Tartt's books have been so hyped up for so long ever since I heard about them and I was just afraid of picking them up because I was afraid of being disappointed. So my perfectionism is not just in the sense that I don't do things in case I disappoint myself it's also that I don't do things in case they disappoint me because I just feel like her books are so perfect for me like the vibe I get from them, the dark academia, the dark <laughs> part and the academia part as well but I just feel like her books would be perfect for me and I'm so afraid of being disappointed and of not liking them so that's what's been stopping me from reading her books, but not anymore because I recently bought The Secret History by Donna Tart, and we're actually gonna be starting this book today together and yeah, you can watch me face a fear and you can hear my thoughts on it or at least on the first chapters, the beginning of the book. So yeah, I think it's gonna be a fun and cozy day of writing and reading. When working on a new project, Donna Tart starts by writing by hand, which is very convenient because, as you know, I didn't really prepare for this draft. I just dove right in. Even though the story I'm currently writing has been in my mind for about a year, only the first act of it was fleshed out when I started drafting, and I'm currently on the second act, which I'm not so sure about. Because of this, lately I've been doing each writing session by the seat of my pants, which works great for some writers, but not so much for me. So today's goal is to brainstorm and outline more of the second act, which I'll be doing mostly in my notebook. 
She writes for four hours in the morning. If it isn't going well, she stops and does something else. But if it's going well, then she'll work until she's tired. I'm tired. <laughs> it's now the afternoon and I'm going to take a break from brainstorming and outlining and I'm going to read. So let's do this. It's much later. I hope you don't hear the noise from the fireplace, but you probably do, so I'm sorry. I just don't really want to leave this place. It's so comfortable here. It's really warm. Uh, I'll eventually go back to my desk and work.
but for now I just finished the first chapter of the secret history and I have some thoughts first of all because there's so much of the dark academia vibes that is criticized for example how pretentious it is I thought that this book would be the epitome of that and it is of course it is because this is what basically started the whole academia dark academia vibe aesthetic trend but the thing is this book is very aware of it which I thought was one of the criticisms to this book and to the dark academia aesthetic the pretentiousness and the unawareness but this is so aware of it and Donatart keeps emphasizing the theme like I, I was really surprised and um, surprised in a good way I was impressed and I thought oh smart when she started with what's his name paper Richard yeah Richard or John Richard, John. John Richard. okay Richard so right in the beginning when Richard is looking back at the events that are about to unfold in this book he acknowledges his fatal flaw and throughout the first chapter the teacher Julian also acknowledges a lot of the realities and themes that I feel are about to be explored in this book for example okay so when they are talking about they were a very formal people extraordinarily civilized rather repressed and yet they were frequently swept away en masse by the wildest enthusiasms dancing frenzies slaughter visions which for us, I suppose, would seem clinical madness, irreversible. Certainly, the group nature of the hysteria had something to do with it as well. Uh, this group hysteria, I feel like, is gonna be a big part in the murder that's about to take place. And also, the extremism of the offer was appealing as well. So throughout the first chapter there are a lot of hints and these hints these hints to the theme are not given by someone else okay uh, so they're given by the teacher which i'm really curious to see the part that the t teacher will play in the murder because i know the group of students is involved in the murder but I wonder what's the role of the teacher in all of this in the future but let me just move so you can see Pompo. I also feel like a lot of the conversations here are still so relevant today I know that this was published before 2000 I think 1999 no 1992 so this was pu first published in 1992 before I was born but I was reading this and when Richard decided to accept to enter this class despite all of the rules which I'm not gonna spoil it for you if you haven't read it yet but when he decided to join the class I was just thinking what is he gonna do with his future like what is he gonna do when he leaves college because I think this is bringing up questions that I, as a college student, also had. Which are like... I feel like studying in college nowadays is such a privilege. Because nowadays what we study in university, even if it's not a dead language as they are studying, is not how to live in the real world. Okay, reading this book feels so nice imagining that setting and also kind of for me remembering my time in college and the things that i learned and that i were, was really passionate about uh, for example literature none of those things are helpful to me in the real world but they were a privilege and they were a pleasure to be learning about and to be talking about and 
and this reading this is that same kind of pleasure like I spent the whole afternoon just reading the first chapter chapter because I kept reading and rereading some sentences and some excerpts because it just felt so nice and nostalgic and I can definitely see how this started a trend but the book itself throughout at least this first chapter but I have a feeling that this has a very strong voice and this has a very strong self-awareness so I feel like that's gonna continue throughout the book but I lost my train of thought yeah I just I don't feel like leaving this book I feel like continue reading it and continue talking about these topics which are meaningless in today's world but they are so fascinating and these are topics that I love talking about with people and I'm so intrigued by them but they are leisure they are a privilege they are not going to prepare me for the future they're gonna prepare me to murder someone like they did to these guys <laughs> no I'm joking of course <clears throat> okay uh, so the fireplace is right here Pom Pom is right here sleeping with me you can see it okay sleeping and I really feel like just staying here and breathing but um, I still need to write today's 1667 words for NaNoWriMo and yeah later but before we go back to writing I really want to listen to the music that Donna Tart listens to or listened to when she was writing the secret history so she says baroque music ambient music and she mentioned Sipilius which she says she listened to a lot while writing the secret history so let's see what they sound like and what we think about it. It's actually so great. So the song I was listening to is called Allegretto. And just that one song has vibes for so many different kinds of scenes. Like I was listening to it and I was just imagining it has that old movie classic 
kind of vibes which makes sense because it's classical music that's good I'm not sure it fits the first chapter of the book but I can see how it would fit in the plot it's good Donna Tart says she likes to work in quiet rooms, but can work almost anywhere. Curled up in a corner in a spare armchair in somebody's house, I can um, I write on the Madison Avenue bus, I write any all, all over the place, um, always have been able to, in the bathtub. There's always a first step for everything. <laughs> 